Hi folks, I'm just putting a quick note in here at the start of the video because at the end of the video I go on to speculate on some motions that Fran Gull is due to rule on but she has completely lost the plot. I couldn't upload this video for a few days due to a power cut and last night she issued an order denying Richard Allen's attorneys of anything really on the outstanding motions and the Franks hearing is not happening. Even though she had previously said that there will be a hearing, I don't know, did she forget she said that or what, but this is very strange, unhinged behaviour from a judge. So she's gone back on having a hearing. She was due to schedule it in. She was just waiting on an update from Richard Allen's new attorneys, but the Supreme Court ruled against her. He got back his old attorneys and now she's decided not going to have a hearing, I'm just not even entertaining this. What has changed in the last few days? What changed is she got embarrassed. She got lit up and embarrassed at the Supreme Court and people in legal circles and her colleagues are laughing at her and she's now taking it out on Richard Allen and his defence attorneys. It's disgraceful, petulant behaviour and there is a blatant bias in this case. She's surely going to recuse herself now, I think, Maybe she is, and she is just being a scorned lunatic, denying motions to her to defence before she leaves, giving them a few kicks before she heads out the door. People are wide awake to her antics at this stage, and they're not going to put up with her quietly. She's a disgrace, and she has to go, in my opinion. Hi folks, I was over the other side of this field. And I looked over and I saw Frances Gull and her two attorneys from the Supreme Court hearing. But, turns out, it's just a few donkeys. She got absolutely mortified at the Supreme Court on Thursday. It was an hour-long hearing. 30 minutes for both sides. It was so intense. I was very impressed with the justices. They were very sharp, very clued in. I would be terrified standing in front of them in that setting under those conditions they all sit really high up towering over everyone making it a really intimidating setting and you can't just go up and give a speech they will interrupt they will question you on any word that you slip up on all the attorneys in this case would have been well aware that this has been live streamed across the world really we all have VPNs or we can just watch someone on YouTube streaming it so the pressure is intense. The justices here seemed very good at asking leading questions that can basically trip up attorneys, lawyers into arguing against what they want, which I think is a very kind and gentle way of coaching the lawyers without outright tuning them up. I thought there was times when they showed respect by resisting to completely just lambast this stupid, irrelevant stuff that some people were saying. A good example of this is when Chief Justice Rush, who was on the ball and done her homework, asked the lawyer representing Judge Francis Gall to go outside of wheat. Give me an example of any other case other than wheat. Wheat is basically an isolated case that Gull's lawyer kept referring to over and over and over again. And he answered that request to go outside of that case by immediately referencing back to the judge that case because he has no other example. Overall, I was very impressed with the justices. It's just very annoying also to see that Indiana clearly has some excellent judges and yet we get stuck with Diener and Judge Gull on the Delphi case. And Franny Gull's argument here was genuinely probably the worst argument I ever heard a judge trying to make. Her interpretation of rules, processes, the US Constitution is dangerous, not just for this case, but for every case she handles. Like she's the one who's being grossly negligent here, not Richard Allen's attorneys. I don't think enough has been made about what she was trying to argue. And it's not that complicated, the whole argument. Basically, what Gull was trying to argue was that in any case, a judge has the discretion to get rid of the defence team or even the prosecution team for no reason other than the judge's feelings. 
They don't need facts. They don't need evidence. It's just completely at a judge's discretion. So no evidence, no findings, no hearings. At any time, a judge has the discretion to kick attorneys off a case. She is mental and an embarrassment for even trying to argue that. Like, that has to be up there with one of the stupidest arguments in the history of Indiana Supreme Court. It has to be, and they've heard some wacky stuff. I thought she was just going to argue on the merits, on why she did it, on the reasons, and maybe argue that the process and procedure doesn't matter given the merits or something like that. But nope, like, don't get me wrong, they're not going to win on that either. But I thought it'd be more of an argument than the one she was trying to make here. They did reference the reasons all right, but then they argued that, hey, these reasons don't even matter. And when the justices were looking into the merits and asking questions around that, they were like, don't even look into it. Just trust us, bro. Trust us. And anyway, it doesn't matter what you think of those merits because a judge has ultimate discretion. At one stage, one of the justices, (laughs) he asked Gull's attorney, if she can get rid of prosecutors in this case because the defence alleged that evidence also came out on that side. There was also leaks there. So he answered, but when he was saying yes she could, he just walks into a trap, his mask slips. He was like, yeah she could, but why would she? There was no hearings, there was no findings related to that. And you could see it on his face, he was like, oh shit, there was no hearings or findings on Richard Allen's attorneys either. So, I probably shouldn't have said that. There was also a lawyer representing Francis Gull that was from the Attorney General's office because they're representing the state and they're standing behind Francis Gull in this situation. Well, she kind of defended her. She was meant to, but because it's so ludicrous, she ended up practically arguing for Richard Allen. Like, Gull's lawyer was just up there and he was saying that Francis Gold doesn't even need to talk to or consult or get his opinion because she already made up her mind to get rid of these attorneys so there's no point chatting to him and then the lawyer from the DA goes up and says a judge must of course consult with any defendant before she removes attorneys from his case which directly just contradicted him both of them were telling porkies they were lying they said that Sure, like we don't know what Richard Allen wants. Nobody knows what Richard Allen wants. We're doing this for for him. We're actually protecting Richard Allen. But all the justices had in front of them a letter from Richard Allen to the judge saying that this is not what he wants. He wants to keep his attorneys. And the Weiss case that he referenced constantly was a case where a conflict of interest exists that hurts the defendant. It is completely different It has no relevance in this case, even though we know Fran Gull did consider trying to get it in. We know that because she referenced a possible conflict of interest. I think she was just saying a quiet part out loud in the meeting in the judges' chambers. We have the transcript, but she throws it out there and then she quickly moves on because I think even she realised that it's a no-go because it does not exist. So... Instead, she just rules on her own motion and gets rid of them. For reasons that she argues doesn't even matter because a judge has the ultimate discretion and she doesn't need to tell us or justify any of her reasons. How dare we even ask? They don't need to have a hearing. They don't need to talk to the defendant in this case. They can just click their fingers and get rid of a defence team at any second. It's so unhinged, dangerous and ridiculous like can you imagine if that was the case under those conditions it's the same basically for private attorneys so imagine spending all your money on private attorneys trying to defend yourself and then a judge comes along and says nah I don't like the cut of them I'm using my discretion to get rid of them get new ones it's an insane argument to try and make ridiculous She mortified herself. And I imagine a lot of judges all over the country are laughing at her because of this. Not just judges, but this is going to be a topic in universities because they like to stay on top of current events, current things happening. I guarantee you that this decision 
and what she tried to do is being talked about in law schools all over the United States this week and next week. And they're laughing at her. They're like, look at this lunatic and what she tried to do. She's embarrassing the whole profession and especially herself. I put together some clips, some highlights to highlight the stupidity of the argument that was made. A free point for anyone who can correctly guess. No cheating, don't cheat. But try to correctly count the number of times that wheat is referenced here. I am Matthew Gutwein, representing respondent, the Honorable Francis Gull. This court should deny the petition for three reasons. First, the trial court's decision to remove Mr. Allen's counsel was an exercise of discretion. In removing Mr. Allen's counsel, the trial court did not abuse the court's discretion. Counsel, is, is that really what's going on here? We don't, we don't have a great record uh, before us on which to um, make these judgments, but reading what we have, um, I'm left with the impression that it, it, it's quite possible that two different concepts, ineffectiveness and insubordination, are, are being conflated here. There seems to be a great deal of concern by the judge that these lawyers were uh, flouting her gag rule um, and that they were uh, insubordinate. But where's the, where's the evidence in the record that they are constitutionally ineffective? I mean, the, the, the order seems couched in that language that we're trying to protect the defendant from his own lawyers, but it's hard to look at this record and not uh, get the impression that perhaps rightfully so, the judge was exasperated with their conduct. But these are two different, these are two different things, aren't they? Insubordination and ineffectiveness. Under the United States Supreme Court decision in Wheat, the trial court, in exercising her discretion to remove counsel, does not need to find constitutionally defective counsel. It does not need to require ineffective counsel. Rather, as in Wheat, there just needs to be the possibility of ineffective assistance But I'm really counsel. struggling with that. I'm, you know, butting that up against the Sixth Amendment um, constitutional right to counsel, um, and particularly when they filed the second petition of filing as private counsel of their choice, that's structural error. You're, and I agree, it is. Okay, you can shake your head, but, it, you know, I'm, I'm reading the, the, the Justice Scalia and taking him for his word on what that is. And how do we get this case back on? So we have that hearing. You have issues with regard to, well, you gave a press release. Well, the gag order was after the press release. You've got, well, we don't like, you know, what you filed in, I think it was in June, with regard to conditions in prison. Well, most of those were wrong. But that means some of them were right. We have in the record now, because we can take notice, there's a new motion to transfer Mr. Allen filed by his current attorneys. So we don't have a hearing. We don't have findings. You've got a constitutional right to counsel. Um, and he's choosing this counsel. You have a constitutional right to say, I don't want an attorney, correct? Under Wheat, as well as Lada, this court's precedent, he does have a constitutional right to select counsel, but that constitutional right is highly limited, and that right may be outweighed by but any it, number of interests. But counsel, it, it, you're a very, and I'm, I'm quoting Chief Justice Shepard, um, in the Knox case saying, a judge has a very limited right to tell someone who their attorney can be. They just decided not to go the parameters there because there was an agreement to withdraw. Wheat says the opposite, Your Honor. Under Wheat, what Wheat says is the trial court is to be given substantial latitude, is to be given wide latitude. What Wheat says is that decision is best left for the intuition and judgment based upon the experience of counsel in weighing those competing rights. Wheat says the issue of whether trial counsel should be removed must be primarily rest, resting. And I don't, I don't read wheat, and I look at wheat several times, as strong as, as what you're doing, and I think, you're, I think what you're doing is you're butting right up against a constitutional protection, and you're doing it at your peril, and this court would do it at this peril, with regard to a case possibly having to be tried twice and having all the, everybody well, that, going through that again. Isn't that a really good reason for us to just go ahead and address the merits? I mean, I'm a little confused why the respondents don't want us to, to address the merits. I mean, I, I realize you think there was no mistake, so why not ask us to just say that? Because these kinds of pretrial claims of constitutional violation are extremely normal. They are extremely rare. United States Supreme Court's jurisprudence in Wheat 
the decision to remove counsel based upon the possibility, based upon the potential for there to be. But, but it has to be done. There, there's a way that you do it. And it does not appear this was done the proper way. You're supposed to have a hearing. The court did it sua sponte, which means on their own motion. There was a hearing in chambers. So did she exceed her authority by the manner that she presented them back in chamber saying, you're either out or I'm going to publicly out you? Well, there's certainly no U.S. Supreme Court case law or Indiana case law that says there has to be a certain amount of procedure. So there's no process involved at all for taking a judge, no hearing, no, I have, I have the suspicion that this is going on. I think you're incompetent and you're out. Well, she was, the trial judge was prepared to have a hearing here. Uh, a hearing was scheduled. Counsel had notice of a hearing. The prosecutor was there ready to present witnesses. And the counsel in this case made their own strategic decision to withdraw rather than go out in open court and have a hearing. And that was their choice. And they made that choice, I'm sure. Having read the transcript, was it a full and free choice? Well, uh, they could have gone out and had a hearing and presented evidence. Uh, they didn't do that either. What they Would did any of those draw. actions have been non-feudal? I mean, I thought the judge made clear that her mind was made up. She had prepared a script. She'd already made the decision. They wanted a hearing. They could get it. But, but there was no opportunity to persuade her. Did I misunderstand? I, we'll never know, right? Because there wasn't a hearing because counsel elected to withdraw. You do know because she said then at the hearing on the 31st, what's changed? So, which means... Well, we, we won't know what know would that. have happened at a hearing that never happened. But you're right. Uh, I mean, I, I, I certainly acknowledge that, that... Uh, there's a, she probably wouldn't have, have changed her mind. Um, what can you tell me, what can you point to in the record that supports a finding yeah. that these lawyers were ineffective to the point where they needed to be removed to, to, to protect the rights of Mr. Allen? Again, under Wheat, there doesn't have to be a finding that they were actually ineffective. What there has to be a finding of, and this is under Wheat, that there is the potential to be ineffective and the trial court is rightly and appropriately able to exercise under wheat and i quote intuition and judgment based upon experience he wants the, these attorneys and so you're you're we're spinning and spinning and spinning on this saying delay and this but he wants these attorneys there's not been these findings with regard to in, incompetence there's a lot of words out there but let him have his attorney to get the, get this case back. I'm really struggling with why he can't make that decision that that's in his best interest and get this case moving again. Let me answer that in two ways, Your Honor. First, again, in Wheat, the accused in Wheat, Mr. Wheat, Wheat it was a that major conflict. conspiracy with lots of different people playing. I mean, in the Wheat case, wheat I, I don't himself, see Wheat as, as tucked as neatly as you find Wheat. So wheat go outside Wheat and give me something else. Well, but again, Wheat himself. Where can you point to me saying with regard to saying somebody is incompetent or negligent? That's like, we have a string of cases. So these conflict cases have come up before with disqualification. I've not, where are we on this? Well, again, it is certainly not consistent with the norms of the profession to negligently and repeatedly allow the unauthorized disclosure of highly confidential material that will pollute the jury pool. And here we already have a jury pool that is polluted. Does that rule apply both ways? Because one of the things defense counsel said in their letter to the court was that they believed that the state had allowed the dissemination of information regarding the crime scene. So can a judge disqualify the prosecutors too? Well, again, uh, the judge certainly could disqualify the prosecutor. We don't have any evidence in the record. We have the Mr. Allen's counsel's asserting that. There's never been a hearing on that. There's never been a, a finding on that. I'm just trying to understand the scope of the rule and how sharp of a double-edged sword that this might be, that that any any leak of crime scene uh, photos or anything like that uh, can lead to the disqualification of counsel on either side, I think is your position. Your Honor, our position is under U.S. Supreme Court precedent, as well as this state's precedent, this court's precedent, the trial court is vested with discretion. And even Wheat said. I agree the practical effect of the position you're advocating today will cause the significant delays in this case going to trial. Yes, I agree with that. Does that have to be a factor in the consideration when exercising discretion? 
it doesn't have to be a factor. It certainly can be a factor, right? The, the trial court in exercising its discretion is allowed to consider the totality of circumstances. And again, we went out of its way to say this decision can be based upon intuition and judgment based upon experience, which requires less detailed findings. We're concerned that there should have been more process afforded in this issue, a more uh, full process with respect to the issue of removal. What possible harm could there be if we were to uh, go do it, do it the right way? I mean, if we're concerned about the eventual finality of these proceedings, everyone having to go through and do it twice, you know, whether we uh, reinstate counsel, we remand with current counsel and say you need to go through this process, wouldn't that save time in the long run? Well, let, let me, perhaps, we don't, we don't know, but let me wouldn't offer this. Wouldn't that protect everyone's interest in finality in the yeah. long run? Uh, we really don't know what Mr. Allen wants. And it was not necessary for the trial court to hold a hearing to judge his wants because she was removing counsel. Should we like and we at least start with a presumption in favor of the continuity of counsel? There is presumption uh, highly significant rule, weighted. something like it. Um, at the end, the desire of um, a defendant, the state agrees, to either retain his counsel that he's had is a factor a court has to consider and give weight to. Then are, are you aware of any Indiana cases where attorneys have been disqualified on grounds similar to this? Um, no, Your Honor. In, the, the wording the judge chose is unique in itself. Um, another point that would help with the larger record to explain exactly what uh, the judge means, um, but it's not the uh, typical language. Just so I'm clear, you, you, you've, you've acknowledged the risk of structural reversible error if this defendant proceeds to trial with the new counsel that are now representing him. Um, despite that, the state's going to double down and say no, no relief today. Is that right? Uh, of course, the only knowledge we have of Mr. Allen is uh, what he wants, what he knows, what he understands is, of course, secondhand. Would minimize or eliminate the, the risk that we're talking about. I see my time's up. Say by the bell. Huh? <laughs> you, you can answer that. <laughs> Um, well, with regards to Wheat, Wheat says, where a court justifiably finds an actual conflict of interest, that's when the discretion kicks in. Conflicts of interest are different. It's just an unhinged, embarrassing argument being made from a judge. I thought the justices would take a week or two. I thought it would be a quick decision. That would be quick. Maybe sleep on it at least, but they didn't even need to after a few hours. Before they went home that evening, they issued a ruling granting Allen's request to have his original attorneys reinstated. They said no to a speedy trial, which doesn't really matter anyway because they can just issue a motion for that now. And they declined also to remove the judge, which would have been an extraordinary step. But I thought they would consider that. I thought they would give that more time. They weren't even asking questions about that at the hearing, so I think Judge Frances Gull should immediately recuse herself from this case. She has now become a thing. She is now a story. She has a mountain of motions that she needs to rule on. I think she hates work. She hates work on this case anyway. The amount that it's bringing her. Like, we know she has a big workload. We know that she referenced that she didn't even read the Frank's motion in full yet. And now we're all going to be asking ourselves, how every time something is filed, we're going to be like, did she read that properly? Like, th thinking thoughts like that should not exist in this case. We shouldn't be wondering if the judge read submissions. I think she has a bias in this case before this. And even if you think she didn't, she defo has no, she has to. She got embarrassed, she mortified herself, and this will sting and she will have resentment. Does anyone trust or want her ruling on motions in this case? 
can she be trusted not to be biased with them? Do we want someone who doesn't understand basic concepts and the US Constitution ruling on this case? I hope she recuses herself for everyone's sake, including Abby and Libby, and I think that would be the honourable thing to do. Recognise that you have a bias, recognise that you're at least no compromised, and recuse yourself and walk away. Indiana has some decent judges. The community of Delphi needs a better one than this. Good luck, God bless, I hope everyone has a nice day.